Welcome back to the show, everybody. We got a great one lined up for you today. Brad Garlinghouse answers the question, do you want to go public with Ripple in the United States? We got that and so much more. Somebody roll that beautiful intro. Digital Perspectives with Brad Kimes. Come on in. Welcome back to the show. You can follow us on Twitter, YouTube, and DickPerspectives.com for exclusive content. Right now, $2.67 trillion market cap for crypto. The market is off by 1.1%. $67,700 plus for Bitcoin, $3,800 plus for Ethereum, $112 billion plus market cap for USD Tether. While XRP at the number eight spot right here is at $0.52. Cents. We're flat on the 24-hour and off by 2.9 on the seven-day. The range of price is between $0.52 and $0.53. Cents. We'll keep an eye on it. I want to remind everybody that next Tuesday, just four days away, mark your calendars. We are doing a weekly space, DAI and myself, Digital Asset Investor and myself. You are not going to want to miss this every Tuesday at 12 p.m. Eastern Time. Mark your calendars. This is going to be a great, great space. You're going to want to be there, ladies and gentlemen. There's lots to talk about. Mark your calendars. And then look at this. Looks like the Biden administration has just shown their true colors, ladies and gentlemen. President Biden veto ignores the voices of the American people and the bipartisan support for Congress as he vetoes the resolution that was put through to him and his desk, which is the SAB 129, right, or 121. And uh, it shows us exactly where that administration truly is. And here it is again, uh, President Biden vetoes bill and allows highly regulated financial firms to hold Bitcoin and crypto. They're fighting it tooth and nail. But Fred Rispoli reminds all of us, as he said in his last crypto town hall, approval of an Ether ETF doesn't mean SEC thinks ETH ain't a security. The crypto fight is only getting more intense from here on out. So buckle up, ladies and gentlemen. It does not mean that Ether is in the clear from a securities designation. Coming from Fred Rispoli from Hoddle Law. Shout out to you, Fred. Well, after only a few hours, Brad Garlinghouse says, this post didn't age well. And this is acknowledging the Biden veto overturning the SAB 121. And this really is incredibly disappointing from this White House. At an incredibly pivotal time is an understatement. And that is absolutely spot on for Brad Garlinghouse here. You know, uh, Chad reminds all of us that passing the Fit 21 Act would make SAB 121 meaningless because crypto would be placed under the CFTC. SAB was really a stopgap measure until full regulations were in place. The Senate needs to take up the bill Fit 21, pass it by a large majority, supermajority, will override a veto. And obviously it's looking like that's what needs to happen at this point. I think Chad's spot on. I think the other question to this too, what Chad's leaning into here, is the idea that they may have consciously rejected from the White House SAB 121 and sent the message to pass Fit 21 if you want this, right? and get it done, and get it done in a way that uh, we don't need SAB 121 as a stopgap measure. And if that's the case, and they are planning on a bipartisan level, uh, and it really should be a nonpartisan issue altogether, but nevertheless, if they pass this in a bipartisan way for the Fit 21 Act, then that may be what was happening here. We'll have to see. We don't know, and there's no reason to trust this current administration at all, right? But it could just be that they're going to pass Fit 21, and that'll go through with the president, too, if we get a bipartisan vote on that. But the, but the fight, the argument, and the knee-jerk reaction is as, well, we had a bipartisan vote to the SAB 121. Why did he veto that? Well, again, unless it was to say, let's keep everything in a place where the banks can't get into this until we have a more complete bill and not just a striking down of a rule from the Securities Exchange Commission. We'll see. Uh, I think we really need a reset, says Hester Peirce here. And, you know, again, speaking to the point I was just talking about here, 
We have to acknowledge that, you know, uh, first of all, we know Hester Peirce inside the SEC has been very vocal that regulation by enforcement is not what's needed here. And she's going to lay it down for you. Heard a lot about throughout the conference is concern from, you know, attendees here about regulation via enforcement, about the aggressive tack that the SEC has taken in enforcement matters. Does it concern you as a commissioner that so many in the industry are viewing the SEC as an adversary or, or as a obstacle to progress? No, it certainly does. And I mean, I, I think I've had some similar concerns um, to what you've heard that we're using enforcement as the primary way to make policy in this area. And that's just not the most effective way. It's not effective for the industry, but it's also not effective for us as a regulator with limited resources. And so I think we really need a reset. Um, we need to engage people in policymaking whose job is not enforcement, who's, but whose job is actually policymaking. And that's a different set of people at the SEC. It seems that there is a... There you have it right there. And I tell you, we got some more news on that front coming here in a second. But I'm reminding everybody of what we've already covered here that, you know, want to tap into $16 trillion opportunity? These financial market firms just paved the way. This is a reminder, and who you're looking at here is Nadine uh, Chakar, who is formal head of Securency, which was acquired by the DTCC. The head of digital assets now is Nadine uh, Chakar for the DTCC with that acquisition acquisition of Securency, which is why I'm reminding everybody here that this is really first in history. First in history, a revolutionary technology has started from the retail side, and this is what she says. I want you to hear it, and now it's engaging the institutional side. Take a listen. It's not just tokenization. You've got real-world assets and you've got uh, the, uh, the digitized assets that go with it. So we've got to compare and contrast and bring those together because an investor, an institutional investor, is going to have both. Now, what's really fascinating with the era that we're going through right now is for the first time in our history, this revolution, whether it's crypto, it's digital technologies, everything, it's been led by the retail side, right? So it's taken a while for the institutional side to catch up. And we're starting to see the winds change here in a good way. You mentioned as well, we had a banner week last week. We got Fit21 passed. We had uh, the ETH uh, spot uh, ETFs uh, approved. Uh, at least the applications got approved. So this is all trending in the right direction. And uh, I think it's like the foliage. One morning, morning you're going to wake up and you're going to see everything in blue. And it's my expectation that we'll continue to trot around until we get there. But DTCC's role here is simply to get this coalition of the willing together for all of us to work forward so it's a common infrastructure that is open, that's resilient, that's interoperable, that's scalable, as we do with the markets today. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, amazing the way she just laid that down. Again, reminding everybody, Securency was acquired by DTCC. Securities protocol can be utilized with Ethereum, Stellar, Ripple, EOS, and other distributed ledgers, as well as all, all the legacy systems that currently are in use today, allowing for seamless on-chain and off-chain movement of tokens. Big things coming. And look at this guy. This is Jack McDonald right here from Standard Custody and PolySign. And I just saw him at DC Blockchain Summit. Shout out to him. We're all wondering what's happening to PolySign. And we haven't heard anything as of yet. But we want to hear what Jack has to say so far for Standard Custody and Trust Company and uh, Ripple's focus here. Take a listen. We started PolySign, the parent company for Standard Custody and Trust, which is a New York qualified custodian. Uh, we're days away, hopefully, from closing our transaction and selling Standard Custody and Trust to Ripple, uh, upon which I'll, I'll be joining Ripple. I'm quite excited about that. Can you talk a little bit about what was the strategic importance of, of that for Ripple? Why was Ripple interested in, in buying Standard Custody? Ripple's really evolved from what, uh, 10 or 11 years ago, was a cross-border payments company to today uh, really more uh, broad-based in terms of tokenization, payments, custody, and, and, and the not-too-distant future will be stablecoin. And I think in the end have uh, focused on a mission to provide enterprise-based solutions for uh, those institutions who want to tokenize, store, move, and exchange value on blockchains around the world. And so. 
Uh, specifically, getting a trust company is a very strategic fit for them to do that. Uh, Brad Garlinghouse, CEO, announced a number of weeks ago at Paris Blockchain about the intention to launch a stable coin. I think when you consider Ripple's global payments network, there's a broad global base of financial institutions who increasingly have been using stable coins as a means of payment and a settlement token uh, for that payment. I think Ripple wants to natively be a part of that. Huge news. Yeah, big. Like Ripple exciting. launching a stable coin that competes with USDC, Tether, PYUSD. And I think Ripple rightly uh, views the ecosystem as a rising tide uh, lifting all ships, and so you don't want to fight that. There's plenty of room for more high quality, um, you know, liquid stable coins out there. So this is not a, a winner take all sort of, uh, you know, journey that Ripple is looking to go on. Quite the opposite. I think they're looking to work with the circles of the world and other. Uh, issuers to you know benefit to benefit everybody in the space and i get it you know and shout out to jack for that and we certainly uh are eager to hear anything on the poli sign front for sure we'll keep you posted as soon as we can find out about it but nevertheless i'm reminded uh nonetheless of um oh and this is a uh, i wanted to show you this too but we'll, we'll save that for later i want to show you this right now which is uh let me see if i have this correct here it's right here. So remember when the stable coin was announced and the anti-crypto and the anti-XRP army immediately began saying they don't need XRP. Brad Garlinghouse saying they lost a plot was him being a CEO and being generous. I think the real plot involves staying in XRP community to attract the views that come with Ripple and XRP and using those views to then promote other tokens, all of which have no legal clarity, by the way. This is why they don't leave, but instead try to convince all of the reasons XRP is bad. There's no question about that. But I want you to hear this clip right here from Brad Garlinghouse. And what does this mean for XRP? Do the two work in tandem or does the stable coin supplant XRP's utility? Okay, we are 100% behind the growth and development of the XRP ledger and the health of that market and that ecosystem. We think having a stable coin built on the XRP ledger actually adds liquidity to the XRP ledger. Uh, we already have been using stable coins in our payment flows. So this is just kind of a natural extension. We'll continue to ab absolutely prioritize XRP, but there's times and places where our customers want to see uh, US dollar to US dollar using a, a Ripple stable coin, we think makes sense in those flows. And not only have they built out their offering to the institution, so you got this one-stop experience, right? that they can offer custody, whether it's over in Europe or whether it's here in the States, right? Remember, they bought Medico and then they also bought Standard Custody and Trust Company. And with that, they also picked up some money transmitter licenses that helped extend their reach as well. So, and then there's the addition of this stable coin that's about to come. And remember yesterday we covered very quickly that Brad Garlinghouse mentioned when talking about USDC stable coin, he said at one point, Ripple was responsible for 20% of USDC's flows. So you could take 20% of USDC and just put that number into Ripple stable coin because they won't need to use USDC unless their customer happens to have it in hand when they come to the market, right? So th look, this is getting very good. And again, I believe what they're doing is a perfect play. The, the, the stable coin industry is $150 billion big right now. And looking at everything in this space, we know that clarity is still not quite there, right? And we know that USDC has just pulled back their legal domicile back to the United States. So now we have PayPal. It, look, as I said, the, the picture's taking shape just as we've talked about here. Okay, we're, we're, we're going to see multiple stable coins created because that's going to be a new use case for digital, for paper dollars and bonds and notes, right? To soak those things up as they come back home. Because what we're, why are we going to need to soak those things up? Because other countries like in the BRICS coalition can trade in their local currencies and they could use a bridge asset in the future and now if they want to right now to not have to touch the U.S. dollar to keep elevating it as a uh, uh, global reserves currency. That's the move they're going towards. So what I see is the United States preparing for that with introducing the onset of an introduction of 
stable coins and private issuance of stable coins, whether it be banks or non-banks, as long as they're regulatory compliant, right? And they issue it underneath the framework that's coming from FIT21. This creates more use cases to soak up those hyperinflated dollars, offering everybody an actual digital dollar from your phone, meaning that anything that happens in the way of inflation or hyperinflation is going to be absorbed on the paper side from the people who are issuing digital dollars because they'll be required to give us a dollar, right? (laughs) Oh, I hope this is not lost on anybody. This is big what we're watching happen here. And I do believe, understanding that we're going to see three, $5 trillion stablecoin market in a very short period of time, you're talking about a real chance to capture a large part of this market, knowing that we're about to also get, let's call it Fit 21 for the moment. And if we get that by the end of the year, massive amounts of institutional money moving onto the network, we know that there is no other network that has spent the amount of time in the last plus decade to get that kind of connection with the institutions and the financial systems the way Ripple has. We know that there's 1,700 contracts they're currently trying to keep quiet right now and sealed for their business strategy. And if they can do so, I think we're all about to find out someday when we get legal clarity just how hard they've been working the last decade plus. Come on in. Guarding House explains why it's easier for Ripple to repeg its stable coin once it's launched than USDC even. He goes on in this example to explain that, you know, USDC had a moment not long ago where they had depegged to like 93 cents and then Circle, the company, came out and said, you know what, we'll back it, we'll cover the gap, it's worth a dollar. And then he makes the point here, Ripple could do the same thing, but that's because Ripple's got 20 or 30 billion dollars in behind them. Take a listen. The second thing. Circle stepped in and said, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll stand in the, that gap that, that went down to 93 cents. And Circle said, we guarantee a dollar. And it, USDC didn't move. That's partly because I think Circle doesn't have a new balance sheet. Had Ripple said that at the same time, I think you would have seen USDC regain its pay because Ripple has $20, $30 billion in balance sheet behind it, which I think would have been a positive thing. So, look, I think USDC is going to continue to be very successful. I think. You know, the, the, the Ripple stablecoin, which we haven't really announced the name around yet, but uh, we, I'm very optimistic there's a lot of market share there. There's a lot of growth, and so... There is a lot of growth there, no doubt about it. And what he's saying is, is that if there is ever an issue with a Ripple stable coin, they basically could say, look, we'll cover any gap of DPEG that happens because they got a bunch of XRP behind them. That value of XRP can stand behind that gap should it happen. It's a pretty remarkable point. Now, I want to take you back to 2021 and just let you hear this very quickly here. Uh, This is from Bank XRP. And again, 2021. But look, think about where we are and how close we are now to the banks actually using all of this technology and assets for their business. And in fact, they actually have started. Right. We're going to look at evidence of that in just a second. But take a listen right here. I think I could bring this in halfway here. They're talking about, obviously, the major competitors, SWIFT, Bank of America. Ripple is a major competitor. Take a listen. Using distributed ledger technology to solve correspondent banking challenges. And, you know, their technology offers bidirectional messaging in the payment system. The major competitor to SWIFT is is Ripple. You know, Ripple is used to connect these real time rails using SWIFT instant. Uh, But I will say in the time that I have left that a major competitor to SWIFT is is Ripple. You know, Ripple is using RippleNet. It's it's using distributed ledger technology to solve correspondent banking challenges. And, you know, they're... And there you have it. And that's 2021. But look at where we are now. They're getting ready to launch a stablecoin. The FIT21 bill needs to pass the Senate and get signed. It's got bipartisan uh, 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 collaboration to get the bill done. Things are happening. 
And like I said, banks are already using it. We've launched Uphold as a Service, a fully licensed global white label solution. This new offering enables partners to quickly introduce their own branded digital asset services, unlock the new revenue streams while ensuring compliance and security. This is absolutely happening because of the partnership between Ripple and Uphold. And this is absolutely happening to provide the workaround until we get that legislation. They can continue to work that way if they don't feel comfortable doing it directly. So this is an amazing moment for Uphold because it takes Uphold out of following just the retail speculative trend in their business model. And this brings in a 24-7, 365 offering on the back end, on the business B2B back end. And I love this for Uphold. I love it for Uphold and Ripple. And I love it for the financial system that gets to use it. Uh Uh-huh. And then remember, while all of this is happening, Hester Peirce just comes out on the heels of a new election and a possible new administration, which I think we'll get here in the States, proposes a joint digital security sandbox between the United States and UK. Wow. You know, Uphold has licenses in both places, too. And they're already white labeling for the banks and financial institutions. Isn't that amazing? Uh Uh-huh. It is. Yes, it is. UK is also a great big home financial hub for the world. Yes, it is. Uh Uh-huh. This is Lynn Martin from the New York Stock Exchange welcoming all IPOs. In the crypto-specific end of the IPO market, Mm -hmm. Circle's talked about wanting to go public. Are there there any other names that you're looking at or anything else you want to speak about? There's a tremendous amount of innovation in this market. And depending on the pace of innovation, you know, we'd welcome anyone who is ready to go public to go public. Uh, the markets are ready, the markets are willing to embrace, and the markets are, are hungry for new companies, particularly tech-driven companies to come to market. Last- there you have it. Now let's listen to That's Brad. A question. Ask if he's going to IPO. Do you want to go public? That's a good question. Uh, <laughs> my pause is, look, today, sitting here, Gary Gensler is the chair of the United States SEC. I'm not really popular inside the offices of the SEC, as you might imagine. Well, the NYSE <laughs> president was in that chair yesterday, and she said that she welcomed applicants uh, from the crypto ecosystem, IPO markets heating back up. Lynn Martin, I think, is a progressive example of where we should be. That's not where Gary Gensler is. And so the, the SEC has to approve an S1. Going public in the United States for Ripple right now, I don't think makes any sense. Uh, I think Coinbase, as a public company in the United States, probably regrets that decision. Uh, we've looked at, you know, would we consider going public outside the United States? That, of course, is uh, in the possibilities. Right now, it's just not on our immediate term uh, agenda. Last year at this time, I was talking to Coinbase about their wells. And there we go. That was pretty much the end of that exchange here. You know, you have to remember also, and I'm sure that this is certainly part of it, when he's asked. Do you want to go public? That's a good question. Uh, <laughs> my Look, I think the big thing you have to remember here is they are still in a case with the SEC. If Brad were to concede that they want to go public really badly, it would start to dilute their strong position they have in the case with the SEC right now. Because the SEC would go, oh, well, you want to go public. Well, you know what? Time's a ticking. Why don't you give us more of what we want, right? So... I think it's smart. Brad can't afford to concede that they want to go public any more than he already has because they have to keep a position of strength knowing what kind of SEC they happen to be dealing with today. Now, with that, there is Javon Marks. He's a prominent market analyst here. Says he highlights a significant bullish indicator for XRP, suggesting a potential surge that could see its value multiply 360 times to 200 bucks. And this is why I have a plan. I have a plan for a $5, $10 XRP, and I have a plan for a three-digit, four-digit, and five-digit XRP. And I also have the holy grail plan, which is to never sell it at all. And I hope that you've designed your plan, your portfolio, and your exit strategies to accommodate your life at any price point you need it to. Uh, Because everybody's life is different and everybody's exit terms and strategies and plans are also different. So I have a plan for a small priced $8 to $10 XRP for sure. 
But I also am excited for the days that we're talking about three, four, and five-digit XRP because I believe it's all possible, especially knowing all the news that we've seen and the way the stage is being set, including legislative clarity for the digital asset market space. I couldn't be more excited. Listen, that's going to do it for me. If you want to support the channel, you can do it at digperspectives.com. For almost next to nothing, click the Freedom Zone and come on in for the less than the cost of a cup of coffee per month. You're going to get Google free ads from all my daily videos. You are going to get extra content in the Freedom Zone, and you're going to get a great conversation, a VIP conversation inside the Freedom Zone as well. I hope you will join us. Uh, Not financial advice from me or anyone else. I'll catch all of you on the next one.